Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Fifth Avenue Church Online. And before Tim comes uh, to speak this morning or this afternoon, whenever you happen to be uh, uh, watching this broadcast, uh, I want to invite you to have communion uh, with me as we remember together the uh, death, burial, and resurrection in person of Jesus as he encouraged us to do. So if you would uh, just take a moment to pause the broadcast and uh, go and grab whatever emblems uh, you happen to have handy, uh, whether it be actual grape juice and bread or whether it maybe be coffee and a donut. Uh, our tradition doesn't believe that there's uh, any magical powers uh, in the emblems itself, but they are just tokens to help us to, to remember and to celebrate together. So would you pause just a moment and, uh, and then we will continue on uh, with the broadcast. So welcome back. And uh, as we remember uh, together the life and the death and the person of Jesus, uh, we need to be reminded that remembering is not a passive thing, but remembering is a very active thing. In fact, the time when Jesus and uh, his first followers were reclining just prior to his death and took what we refer to as the first communion uh, elements together as Jesus passed those around. Uh, it was a time of tremendous crisis. The uh, first followers didn't really realize it at the time, but it was a significant crisis that was going to end badly for the moment on that Friday with the death of their master and our Savior. And uh, it was a time uh, in later days when uh, the followers as persecution and suffering was continuing to roil around them, uh, there were tremendous times of crisis where they were kind of taking the elements on the run, but they were always pausing and taking a moment to remember Jesus and to remember the completed work that he has done. So as you think about uh, our world today, perhaps it's not persecution and suffering for your faith, but there are times of terrific uncertainty and disease and death, and it's the perfect time for us. It's always the perfect time, but especially in time of crisis, to together uh, remember together and make connections with one another, even if it's online, and again, to celebrate what a number of people refer to as the Eucharist. When I take time to pause and to remember Jesus, whether I am uh, uh, celebrating with communion, communion elements or not, I oftentimes will light my prayer candle, which has three wicks on it. Uh, and as I'm, as I'm physically lighting those wicks, I am remembering that I have a Savior that is there to help. Uh, there's a Savior that is there to heal and a Savior that brings hope. And so as we take the elements today, I just want to pray that be, we be reminded and that we remember that we have a Savior and a Lord that is alive and well and is on hand to provide us uh, assistance. Uh, Tim referred to that, you know, as grace, as divine assistance uh, for us in our time of need. So as we take the bread today, Lord, we ask for help. We are people that need your provision. We're a people that need protection. And we're a people that need your direction. And so as we take the bread uh, together, uh, we remember that you are the God of all help. And as we take the cup together, uh, we also ask for your healing. There are those among us that need physical healing. There are those that need emotional healing. And there, there are those that need relational healing. And even those that need spiritual healing today. And we're so thankful that you're a God that hears us. And you're a God of compassion that not only hears us but acts on our behalf. And so we ask for your healing today as we take the cup together. And as we consider actively remembering today your death, your resurrection, your life, uh, my prayer is for those like me that are needing help with discouragement or depression, for those that have lost sight of Jesus in the midst of crisis or 
those whose faith perhaps is flickering in the midst of the storm. I pray that you would meet us today. Uh, we know that you are near, and we ask for your help, we ask for your healing, and we ask, God, that you would light uh, the fire of hope within each one of us today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to sign up for uh, a small church gathering in your area. And without further ado, here comes Pastor Tim today. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciated that. I appreciated your prayers for us. Hello, everybody. Thanks again for joining us here. My name is Tim Johnson. If you don't know me yet, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm one of the pastors here at Fifth Avenue Church, and we have been going through the book of Philippians lately. It's a letter written by a guy named the Apostle Paul to a group of young Jesus followers, and we're going to continue to journey through that book today. I actually want to read um, the opening few verses out of Philippians chapter 2 today. It's 11 verses, and I'm going to have to get my glasses because I'm getting old and my Bible, but bear with me. So let me read these verses for you, and we'll put them up on the screen for you as well. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So God squeezed into a, into a human body. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, which was a shameful death in that time. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In these verses, this church leader named Paul is urging these young Jesus followers to be humble, to be humble to the point where they actually imitate the humility of Jesus. What a great idea, because when we're humble, oh, the places that we will go, which is actually the title of this tournament, this, this message, oh, the places that we will go. Let's take a look at the places that our humility will guide us into today. First place is this, humility will take us to unity. Humility always takes us to unity. It will take us to the place where, according to the Apostle Paul here, we are a people that are one in spirit and in purpose. Oneness, unity. That's what Paul is saying is the goal here. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride actually separates us from others because when we operate in pride, we start to view the people around us as nothing more than commodities, as tools that we can use to to help ourselves as tools that we can use to boost our own ego or to advance our cause or to improve our social status. It seems right to use people at times. That's what pride tells us. It's okay to use people because it's helping you. And yet look at what the Old Testament book of Proverbs, this book of wisdom says about this. It says, pride goes before destruction. I have found that to be true not only in my life, but in the life of others. And one of the first things that pride destroys is unity. Because nobody wants to be in unity or in a relationship with another person that considers them a lower life form. If you hang around a person that always treats you and thinks of you as a lower life form, you're not going to be in unity with them. Humility builds unity. Because when we're humble, we are not looking down on people like the proud do. We're looking at people. We actually notice them. We get to know them. We start to treasure them. We want to be around them. And then, boom, unity is born. And this experience of this humility-fueled unity is an awesome experience to partake in. 
Look what Psalm 133 says. It says, How good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. It is like precious oil being poured on the head. Now, in our day and age, if someone came up and poured oil on top of our heads, so it flowed down our faces and according to Psalm 133, down our beards, okay, though some of us can't grow beards and some of us don't want to grow beards, but if somebody did that to us, we wouldn't consider that a good thing. We consider it a prank at best and an attack at worst. But in ancient times, if someone was to pour oil over your head, it was considered a very good thing. It symbolized the fact that God was now pouring goodness and blessings into your life. So this psalm is saying unity is awesome because to live in unity is to have goodness and blessing poured into your life in that experience of unity. And one of the greatest blessings that will be poured into all of our lives when we operate in unity is this. We will get to know God on a much deeper level. Think of it like this. Imagine every person on the planet had these strands of webbing coming out from them and attaching to the people that they loved, to the people that they were in unity to. If that happened, everybody would have multiple strands of webbing coming out of them, attaching to all these people they're in unity with and they love. And so the world would be like a giant spider web. In this illustration, God is that web. Barbara Brown Taylor, this brilliant author, says it best. She says this, God is all over the place. God is up there and he's down here. He's inside my skin and he's outside my skin. God is the web revealed in that singular vast net of relationships that animates everything that is. It's not enough to proclaim that God is responsible for all of the unity. God is the unity. Yeah, to experience and know unity is to experience and know God. It's to get caught up in the web. Second place that humility will take us is to love. Check out verse 3 and 4 again. It says, Do nothing out of vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than ourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interest of others. When we're humble, we're actually able and willing to care and love for other people because our humility paves the way for our acts of kindness and compassion and love to take place. Pride, on the other hand, restricts our ability to love. That's why Paul writes to another church at another time. He writes these words, Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Did you catch that last line? Love is not proud. Pride leads us away from love. Humility leads us towards love. I want to give you a couple of real life examples of how humility, a person's humility, actually led them and the others around them to love. The first is of a one-year-old boy. His name is Will. And when he turned one, his parents threw a birthday party for him, which is common. Most of us had a one-year-old birthday party. And it was mostly his family and his godparents who had a seven-year-old son named Jason. Well, at this party, the normal festivities took place. There were presents and cake and food and laughter and hugs, and it was glorious. And Will was so enthralled by his birthday party, so happy just to be one year old and alive and be surrounded by these great people, that he did a celebratory dance. He did his own little happy dance, which for a one-year-old isn't busting these really impressive moves. It's more like just twirling around a lot and flailing your arms, and that's what he was doing. But at a certain point during this happy dance of Will's, Jason, the seven-year-old, couldn't take it anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so he burst through the circle, and he was ticked that Will was getting all the attention. He was getting none. So he burst through the circle, put both of his hands on Will's chest, and shoved him as hard as he could. Well, Will, being only one, toppled over, and he fell hard, hit his butt first, and then his head snapped back with a crack. And there was a stunned look on his face. He never had anybody be mean to him before. He didn't know what to make of it. 
And then he opened his mouth and just started howling and crying and sobbing. And his mom ran to him, gathered him in, his, in her arms and got him up to his feet again. And that's the moment where Will did something that surprised everybody. Instead of seeking revenge, instead of getting mad and angry and shouting and screaming at Jason, he did the only thing he knew how to do. He did what he always did when he saw Jason. He walked across the room, put his arms around Jason, embraced him, and just pushed his head into Jason's body. And in that moment, Will, because of his actions, got rid of all the meanness in the room. Second one person I want to tell you about is actually older. It's an adult, and his name's Shane. And his name is actually Shane Claiborne. He's written a lot of books, and he's this radical pastor on the East Coast, kind of like an urban hippie. Travels all over the world and speaks, especially about issues of social justice and eliminating poverty in our world. And he's an amazing human being. Well, when he was young, he realized he'd grown up so blessed because he lived in the United States and he had so many, he had all of his needs met. But he realized there are people in the world that weren't so fortunate. So he decided, I have to give. I have to find a way to give and to serve others. So he moved to India, like you do, right? He moved to India and he volunteered in the House of the Destitute and Dying. It's an organization that the late and the very great Mother Teresa started. And it's a house where people can simply die with dignity. They're not gonna get better. You don't come out of that house. It's not like a hospital. It's just a place for them to die and not be alone. And he said the most amazing thing. He said, as I served these people, when I looked into the eyes of the dying, I felt like I was meeting God. That's what he said. I will never forget that because he was meeting God. Now, this is the reason I tell you both of these stories, because pride would have led that little boy to payback and revenge and hatred. Humility led him to a love that put an end to the meanness in the room. Pride would have led the young Shane Claiborne to a life of selfishness and greed. Love led him to a life of selflessness and giving and serving. Yeah, humility actually led him to those things. So in all places, at all times, in all situations, humility, no matter how old we are, or how young we are, will always lead us to love. And the last place that our humility will take us, it will take us to death. That doesn't sound very fun, and it's not. But humility always leads to death, always. It led Jesus to death on a cross in this amazing display of sacrifice and compassion. While humility might not ever lead any of us to a physical death, it will always lead us to other forms of death. Let me share a few things that humility will lead us to the death of. It will lead us to the death of our selfish desires. When you humble yourself, you quickly realize the world does not revolve around just your own needs. There are actually other people with other needs and other feelings in the world. Humility leads us to the death of selfishness, just like it did for Shane Claiborne. Humility also leads us to the death of our constant need to be right. And maybe there's a possibility here. I'm only preaching this to myself. I don't know about you, but I seem to have a constant need to be right. I hate to lose arguments. I hate to be notified that I'm wrong. Oh, I hate it. I want to be right. And there's a part of me believes I kind of always am. Okay, that's my pride talking. Because in my humility, I realize I'm not always right. Nobody is always right. And humility leads me to a better relationship with others because I can honestly receive their correction and realize they were right and I was wrong. Humility also leads us to what I call the death of lines. Our church is called an inclusional church, and it's called that for a reason. It means that everybody's welcome here. Everybody, no matter where they're from, what they look like, how they vote, who they love, how much money they have in their bank accounts, or what their opinion is on where the best pizza place is in our city, which is my neighbor's pizza house, by the way. And I actually think I'm right about that. So that's a whole other topic. But pride draws lines. It says, here's a line. On this side is me, and I'm in. On that side of the line is you, 
and you're out. Humility puts an end to those lines. Several times in sermons over the years, I've told you a story about one of my favorite authors who was a pastor in Colorado at one time, and she writes this. After ranting about stupid people who have wrong opinions, she's so honest, isn't that great? After ranting about stupid people who have wrong opinions, my husband looked at me and said, you know, the thing that sucks is that every time we draw a line between us and others, Jesus is on the other side of it. And that is so true. Lines are no good. And the humble know this because lines exclude people. Humility includes people. And the last thing that humility leads us to the death of is what I call the death of labeling. We love us some labels in our culture, don't we? We put labels on everything. We put them on clothes, on cars. We put them on medicines. We put them on beauty supplies. Some of you even have your own private label makers. You know who you are, don't you? Labels are fine most of the time, except when we put them on people, because we seem to insist on putting these insidious, awful labels on people, unwanted, unlovable, unforgiven, bad, jerk, the list goes on and on. And we haven't even gotten to all the R-rated labels that seem to be some of my favorites, okay? We have to realize something. There is great power in the words that constitute these labels because words create worlds. Words create worlds. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say you have someone in your life and you truly don't want them to be your enemy, but that looks like where things are heading. But you don't want that. Start by not naming them an enemy. Don't speak it. Don't say it. Don't pronounce the label that you're tempted to place on them. Because once you get that label on them, it is really hard to get it off. But pride will tell you, but I need to label this person. Because that way other people will know that they're my enemy. They'll know that this person is bad and that I'm good. And then they'll know who to root for. And plus, I want to label them because it makes me feel superior to that person. And I love that feeling oh so much. Humility says, according to verse 3, if you're going to label someone, fine, go ahead and label them. But use this label, better than you. That's what it says. Die to the tendency to slap these negative labels on people and instead put the label on them that says better. Let that sink in for a moment. So if being humble is so great and if it takes us to such great and important places, then the question is, how do we get humble? And that's a great question. There's a lot of ways that we can get humble. I'm going to share with you just two surefire ways. They're foolproof. Every time I've tried either one of these, and especially both in combination, I've always been humble. The first is this. Ask. Just ask to be humble. When we pray and make our request to God, sometimes those prayers are answered in a way that we don't expect. Sometimes we're told no. The answer to your prayer is actually no. Or sometimes we're told to wait. But let me tell you something. In my experience with God over the 40 plus years that I've known the Lord and followed him, whenever I pray this prayer, God, please humble me. He answers it before I can even finish forming the words. It's like he says, oh, done, done. I'll humble you right now. And then right after I pray that, I am led into all these like a series of unfortunate events that humiliate me and embarrass me and humble me. He answers that prayer so quick. And get ready because we're going to pray it today. And you'll see. You'll see. The second thing you can do if you think that's not good enough is you can simply think about God. You can do that. I want to read for you out of Psalms, out of one of the Psalms, Psalm 111, just verse 2 and 3. Listen to what it says. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. The psalm writer, the poet, was saying it's so good to just stop what you're doing and to think about God. And when we do that, one of the things that happens is we are instantly humbled. 
when I consider who God is and what he does, I can't help but be humbled because I realize that God contains everything, but nothing can truly contain God. God is the stupendous, wondrous more. That's a word I would describe. What's God like? He's more. No matter what we say about him, no matter how we describe him, no matter how we think about him, no matter what we read about him, God is always more than that. And he can create the stuff he does. He creates big things like galaxies and planets. And yet he creates super cool small things like potato bugs that have duck faces on them. I'm not kidding you. Google it. It's a thing, okay? Really pondering God always makes me feel small. But not in an insignificant way, not in a belittling way. But in a, oh my gosh, I'm just filled with wonder because God is amazing in that kind of way. It's so humbling. Let me pray for us today. I've talked enough. Oh, the places we will go, Lord, when we are humble. Great places, important places. So today we pray this very risky and kind of frightening prayer. God, and I pray it for all the church, not just me. I'm not going on this journey alone, Lord. God, for our whole entire church, I pray, please humble us. Let the embarrassing situations begin, if that's what it takes. But please humble us, Lord. And I know you'll answer that prayer in a hurry. And please humble us also by inviting us to have these moments where we stop what we're doing and we consider what you are doing. And we consider who you really are. We will be humbled and filled with wonder in those moments. Thank you, Lord, for this section of scripture today. Thank you for all the people I'm connected with in this faith community. And thank you most of all for your unfailing love in our lives. In your name we pray. Everyone set? Amen. Thanks again for joining me here today. We'll bring another message to you next Sunday. Make sure, like Jay said, that you check out some of the small church gatherings. I absolutely love those. And we'll see you here again in a week. Blessings.